welcome everybody. Today we're going to continue our discussion about regulation and we're going to focus today on taxation which is um, study unit three and also study unit five. All right, so we're going to talk a bit about filing status. Remember, um, not last class, but the class before that, we spent a lot of time talking about filing status and why that's so important and what's the implications of um, having a head of household filing status, for example, or if you're married and you're filing separately, the implications of that. So that, I think that was a good preview for you for um, study unit three and study unit five. So when you got into that, um, that should have um, been familiar to you. So today we're going to expand our discussion and we're going to focus on the individual income tax formula, which is what I've um, put here on the board, which essentially is what? What's the, when we talk about the individual income tax formula, what is that? What is it that we're trying to determine? So ultimately what we're trying to determine is how much tax we owe. What is ultimately the net total tax? And then from that, we're going to subtract payments. Now, what are payments? This is just a little preview. We're going to go through all of this, but um, for example, the most common payment is the withholding from our paycheck. So yeah, we get credit for that. We deduct that as a payment from the total tax that we owe. And um, some file estimated tax, which is what? Every quarter you send in, for example, 1040 ES. So ES is estimated. 1040 X, we saw last time, is an amended return. So at the end of the year, the government would prefer that there be no surprises. So at the end of the year, if you think that the government is going to be happy because you mail them a check for $1 million, you're mistaken. <laughs> They're not happy about that. They would rather, if you expect that at the end of the year, you owe $1 million to the U.S. Treasury, then they would prefer that you send them $250,000 each quarter. Now, how do we do that? We do it through a 1040 ES. That's estimated. So it's not just your, uh, your salary, your wages, which is an important part of income, but also um, other sources of income that may not have withholding. So think about that um, for your clients and also for yourself as you advance in your career and make more money and have investments that are generating income that you're collecting income but there's no withholding. So for example, if you have a rental property or multiple rental properties, you're collecting rent. You have to pay tax on the rent that you collect. Now we'll talk um, briefly today, but we'll have a, a, a discussion at greater length about Schedule E, where we're going to identify the amount of rent that we collected, and then we're able to subtract our expenses for operating that property, for renting the property, which would be what? So for example, um, let's say we collected $50,000 in rent. We have some expenses. Some of the expenses would be how much we pay in mortgage interest. So we're renting a property that we have a mortgage. The, the money that we pay in mortgage interest is an expense for that property that we could deduct on Schedule E. So we have our income and then we subtract our expenses. Another expense could be for repairs. 
maintenance and repairs. So maintenance, for example, would be if you have um, somebody who's taking care of the lawn. So somebody, you're not there, you have a tenant, somebody is mowing the lawn. Somebody is raking the leaves. Somebody is shoveling the snow. Well, if you pay for that, if you pay to have those services done to maintain the property, then that's an expense. If you do repairs, so let's say, for example, if you have to replace your, um, your furnace, that's an expense for that rental property. If you have to replace your, which, by the way, is about $15,000. Unfortunately, I know this, so it is about $15,000 um, for um, an HVAC um, system, so a heating and cooling system. Um, even if it's a split unit, it's going to be about $15,000. Maybe you could get it for a little less, depends on um, the level of equipment that you get and the features. You, um, if you have to replace the hot water heater, that costs about $1,500. That's an expense for your rental property. If you're paying a um, real estate agent to collect the rent, that's usually about 10%. So if you're um, collecting rent, we said of what, $50,000? Then the property management fees is $5,000. You can um, take that as an expense. So. What about the water bill? The what? Water bill. If you are paying. Well, if you're paying for it, then utilities that you pay for, um, you could um, take as an expense. Now, um, let's say it's, if you're, it's a house that you're renting, then, so there's a property that you own, it's a house that you own and you're renting, then usually the tenant is going to pay the utilities. So the tenant is going to pay the electric. The tenant is going to pay um, the gas, the water, but if for some reason, what you negotiate with the tenant that you will pay the water, or you're going to pay some other utility, then that's an expense for you. But you could only take um, as an expense items that you pay. So if the tenant pay gas of, let's say, $4,000 for the year, you can't take that as an expense. Just like we're going to talk in a bit about Schedule A, medical and dental expenses. So if GHI or Blue Cross Blue Shield paid $12,000 as, right, for your, as um, coverage for your hospital stay or um, diagnostic tests, so medical and dental related expenses, then you can't take that as an itemized deduction. Only what you pay. So again, tell me, so for Schedule E, just a little bit of a preview, because we're talking about income. So we said, um, the reason why we're talking about this is because I said, you know, there's payments, but very often the payments are not going to be enough to cover the tax that we owe. So people are always talking about getting a refund. Clients of mine are always asking about how much is their refund. Like they expect to get a refund. You're not supposed to get a refund. You're supposed to take, pay tax. <laughs> that's the reason. That's the reason that um, that we have income taxation. So there's a certain amount of withholding, and the reason why that money is withheld is because the expectation is that you owe that money to the U.S. Treasury. So for us, in preparing returns for our clients, and again, for ourselves as 
our net worth increases and we have rental properties, if for example, that are going to generate income for us, then we need to know what are some of the expenses that we could take. So there's situations where there's no withholding. So for our wages, so when we talk about income, so it's very important for us to understand um, what income is. So on Form 1040, you go um, through lines 7 through 22, all of these things, the IRS makes a point to distinguish between these different types of income. So there's different types of income. And at the end of the year, we might actually have to pay tax above and beyond what was withheld from our wages and salaries. So we're going to see um, that on line 17, this is where we're going to recap Schedule E. That's where we're going to show whether or not this rental property or an S Corp has yielded a profit or a loss. So determining what's income is an important process in terms of individual taxation. It's not just wages and salaries and tips. What are some other um, forms of income. What else? What about interest? Taxable interest. So right now, the interest rates on savings accounts are very low. So you probably chuckle when you say, well, interest, what, what interest? Um, some banks don't even pay interest on checking accounts, for example. But you might have some investments that are going to pay um, interest. That's a form of income. The financial institution that pays the interest, they report that to the IRS. So I say again, the interest that you earn, the taxable interest, is reported by the financial institution. So let's say you have quite a bit of savings and you've earned interest of about $12,800. So you've been saving, you've been working really hard, you have money saved up, and you're earning interest. And you earn how much? $12,800. And you think, I'm not going to put that. Um, you need to include that. That's part of your income. If taxable interest is part of your income. So you say, but I reported my salary, my wages, my tips, but your taxable interest is also part of your income. Now, besides, as a preparer and also a taxpayer for all of us, right, so not just because we prepare taxes or that we're a taxpayer, because remember we said under Circular 230, we have obligations, professional obligations, to behave in a way that's both ethical and legal. Yes, I know that you might think that the word accounting and ethics is some type of contradiction of terms. And in some cases, that might be. But we're trying to change that perception, despite the financial and accounting scandals that we've all observed. So we need to report the taxable interest, because 
the um, Congress has written into the IRS code that interest is a form of income and that we're responsible for paying taxes on that interest. Does that make sense? So we're responsible for paying taxes on that interest and that's important, right? That there's, we're legally obligated and we have an ethical obligation, but on top of that, we must, we must have common sense and recognize that if we don't report the interest, we're going to get busted. They're on to us. The gig is up. Right? They know. The man knows. The IRS knows that you received that interest. The financial institution reports that. Now, if you don't pay, there's going to be penalties and there's going to be interest. Now, historically, when you get that type of letter audit, a letter audit, basically that's what it is. So, $12,800. Don't, I, I wouldn't expect that um, you're going to see um, law enforcement at your door, but you're going to get a letter in the mail about close to three years from the date that the tax was due, and it's going to say that according to our records, according to our records, you received income of $12,800 on monies that you held and earned interest. And they're going to say that with the penalties and the interest that you owe, what, like $19,000. And then you're going to say, why didn't I listen to Coach Bissell? Why didn't I listen to him? I didn't listen, and now I owe all this money. And they're very adamant about that. It's not like you could say, oh, okay, I'm sorry, can I just pay the $1,200 now? And they're going to be like, no. Um, first of all, they're going to um, suggest that you committed fraud. Right? You knew that you had this interest that you earned that was part of your income, and you deliberately didn't tell them. So what is that? That's fraud. So they're like, you're worried about the interest on the money that you owed and the penalties. That's what you're worried about? We're concerned about, we're right now, we're weighing whether or not um, you should spend time in jail. Now, as that amount gets higher and higher, like, oh, you know what, I didn't report $500,000 in interest, they become less and less amused. To the point where it's like not even funny. See, if you owe them $500,000, that's a big deal. And again, if you do anticipate owing the U.S. Treasury money at the end of the year, you should file 1040 ES and make the payments on a quarterly basis. So remember, they're not going to be happy when you send them a check at the end of the year for a million dollars. They'd rather you send them $250,000 every quarter. They don't like surprises. Now, sometimes, maybe at, at the, towards the end of the year, you had some type of windfall. But then that's something that you could explain and is obvious. But if you have recurring income, like let's say you know that you have this substantial amount of money that's earning interest, and that you're going to have to pay tax at the end of the year, they want you to make quarterly payments. So then we have, what? What else? 
Dividends? Yes, dividends. So remember on the first day we talked about the idea of double taxation? Well, this is where it comes into play. You had shares in a company. The company has two choices as it relates to net income. They could either keep that as retained earnings or they could pay dividends. Now, if they keep it with retained earnings, there's a lot of things that they could do with that retained earnings. But it's either retained earnings or pay dividends. If they pay the money to the shareholders in the form of dividends, then we as shareholders need to pay tax because the U.S. Congress has determined that dividends is a type of income. So what we're doing right now is going through the different types of income. As we said, it's not just wages, it's not just salaries, it's not just tips, but what do we have here so far? Ta also taxable interest, dividends. What else? What else is on 1040? And these are the lines. These are the lines on um, the 1040 form that I posted for us online. Yes, taxable refunds. All right, so what is this? Who could tell us what this is, taxable refunds? All right. Nobody? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, what? Somebody was going to say it? Who? Janelle? Mm -hmm. You're going to blow our mind? Go ahead. But I'm not too sure. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Give it, go. <laughs> Give it a shot. Um, I think I re remember reading, like, if you, if you itemized and um, you owed, I think it's state taxes that's deductible. Not federal. Right. You can actually um, see. Um, You're close. You're very close. You're very close. Go ahead. Go ahead. Think it through. It so what? So, so much to No, no. You're so close. You you just got to close the loop. So what about the? You said you're right that um, on Schedule A, which is itemized deductions, that. Um, one of the sections is taxes that we paid. And so you're right, you can't deduct um, federal taxes, but on the 1040, we could deduct state and local taxes. And then what happens? So we did that, is what you're suggesting, is that we took that as an itemized deduction. Right. And then what happened? It reduced it. Yes? Go ahead. It, uh... <laughs> Well, wait a minute. Okay, so it will reduce AGI. It will reduce the adjusted gross income. Well, it's gonna yes, it's gonna reduce the adjusted gross income. Right. So, so would it be considered above the line? What was that? Would it be considered an above? Well, so why is that um, showing up on line 10, though? So the taxable refund okay, well, has to do uh, with the prior year. Because what happens is, now we're doing um, 2012 returns. So it reduces the income, the, the gross income? But, so, but that we're not, we're not um, debating that. The question is, why in 2012 do, is this income? So the reason is because what happened was in 2011, in 2011, you took an itemized deduction. And that itemized deduction was for state and local taxes that you paid. But then what happened is, so you put on your federal return that you paid taxes to the state and local government of $7,942. So what does that do? Like you're suggesting, is that it's we're going to subtract that from our adjusted gross income to get our taxable income. Now, what happens in the meantime is that you filed your state tax, and that money that you deducted on Schedule A was refunded to you by the state. So the 7,000, how much? Five. 
$7,942 that you took as an itemized deduction on Schedule A on your federal return because you said, I paid, in our case, New York State, $7,942, which is really what? Just our withholding. So you didn't lie. That was the withholding, presumably. And maybe you had um, um, some other payments, but let's just assume that that was the withholding. So you did pay it. But there's a part two to that story. You paid it, and then they gave it back to you. In, our, in this situation, we're assuming that um, you were able to reduce your state taxable income enough that you didn't owe New York State any tax. So they gave you back the $7,942. Or, or we could say that they only gave us back $2,942. Whatever they gave us back in 2012 now, we're going to have to report that as a taxable refund. Why? Because the prior year, we took that as an itemized deduction and used that to reduce our taxable income. After the fact, right, so that was in 2011. So we, everything was, we did exactly what we were supposed to do. We told them that in 2011, we um, paid New York State $7,942 in tax. But then in 2012, we have to reconcile and then say, yeah, we did pay that in 2011, but in 2012, they gave it back to us. Or they gave part of it back to us. Whatever it was, if they gave us back 2,000, or they gave us back 3,000, 4,000, 5,012 dollars, whatever it is that they gave back to us as a refund on our state return, we have to report that the next year on line 10 of our 2012 return as a taxable refund. Does that make sense? Yes. Questions about that? What, if, what about the you pay the tax in 2011? You will uh, include the, the, the refund and the income, but if you pay the tax in 2011, we include the, the deduction over there. You mean like in 2010? In 2012, you pay in the 2011 in tax, and what about the 2012? Yeah, you can so this, this taxable refund, right, that the amount, this is, with, this is income for us. Yes. This refund is based on what we paid in 2011, right? So now this is our 2012 return. In 2011, <laughs> We paid this money, and then we got it back in 2012, or a part of it in 2012. Now, in 2012, we might be in the same situation, because we're saying in 2012, right, now we're in 2013, in 2012, we also paid the state income tax. So we're going to have, it's likely that we're going to have, if we itemize our deductions, we're going to have a deduction here for what we paid New York State in 2012, because we don't know what our refund is yet. We paid it. That was in 2012, now we're in 2013, preparing our 2012 return. There's gonna be an amount here, and for the prior year, if we did get a refund, if we did, right, that's what that says, maybe we didn't. Maybe we paid them $7,942, yes. and that's what we owed. We didn't get a refund, then that's fine, then we don't need to report that here. This is just, we're reporting as income what we received as a refund, in this case from New York State. Now if you don't itemize your deductions, then that's not an issue. But if you do, if you itemize your deductions, so we want to take the greater of the two, the greater of the standard deduction or the itemized deductions. Do you agree? Yes. So, if you have, um, well, well, let's get to we'll get to Schedule A. We'll go we'll go through the items in um, in Schedule A. So, questions about that? Taxable refunds. 
No questions? Are we good? Elam? No questions. No questions? Okay. You sure? If, if, if you're not clear, we could, we could talk um, about it some more. Um, Maybe ask Mohammed. Um, you know when you file the, the, the tax return, right? And sometimes you get the refund, the uh, oral. Is that, would that be considered tax refund? If you get the refund from um, the state and federal, uh, when you file your 1040 and you get return, it's possible sometimes you get the refund. Would that be considered tax refund? Or this is something else? If the reason why it has it doesn't it's not because you received a federal refund. If you received a federal refund, which is down here, right, with uh, preparing form 1040, that's it. We paid what we owe. In fact, in this case, if we got a refund, that means we paid the U.S. Treasury more than what we owe. However, if we itemize our deductions, one of the deductions that we could take is for taxes that we paid, and. In many cases, state tax is, state and local tax is a significant um, expense to us as taxpayers. So, especially in New York, right? So, the federal government says, yeah, we understand. We understand how this, how we're organized as a government. We have a federal government, we have state government, and Part of the process of funding state activities is that we allow states to collect income tax. And they said, we're going to allow you to take that as a federal deduction. So remember, everything about the IRS code is written by Congress, and there's certain incentives, there's certain motivations, there's a certain rationale for every aspect of the tax code. It could be um, some type of political statement or some type of endorsement of some kind. Like we talked about um, as it relates to, remember last time we talked about NAFTA. Remember when we were talking about, we said, well, why would you, why, well, what do you mean? Your dependent could live in Mexico or Canada? And, and um, you could still take them as a dependent. You mean they don't have to live in the U.S.? And so then we thought through. We said, well, why is that? That's sort of unusual. What is Congress telling us? Why would Congress allow that? And then we talked about the significance of NAFTA, the national, what? North American. <laughs> North American Free Trade Agreement. And so Congress knows about NAFTA. And they're saying, yeah, we see the big picture. We have NAFTA, we have the North American Free Trade Agreement, and that being the case, if we're serious about stimulating trade on the North American continent and amongst Mexico and Canada and the United States, then everything should tie together. We should have one integrated message. And part of that is, and one integrated policy, is that if we have a dependent whether it's a qualifying, what, child, and we talked about a qualifying person and the difference, but if your parent, for example, lives in Canada or Mexico, Congress says they might be independent, and we're okay with that. So think about what's going on here where the federal government, the U.S. Treasury is saying, yeah, we know. It's a burden to pay state tax, and so we're going to provide you a tax shield. So a tax shield means that we're going to allow you this deduction. Now, it's not a credit. It's a deduction that provides a tax shield, which is ultimately going to reduce the amount of tax that you're going to owe. So what is Congress saying? They're saying, yes, we support state rights, basically. We support the fact that the states have the right to collect tax, and we also realize it's a burden on taxpayers, and so we're going to help offset some of that cost to you by giving you this tax shield. 
which the amount of the tax shield is going to vary based on what? The tax rate. So that's why if we got a refund from the state, even if it wasn't the full amount, if it's a partial amount, then in the year that follows, we're going to have to report that as income. And then again, we might be in the same situation. But we're always like one year behind. Because at the time that we prepare our return, the best that we could um, report is what we paid, which is the truth. That's what we paid. The fact that they gave it back to us in the next year is what we're reconciling here on line 10. So remember, we're in 2013, we're preparing our return for 2012. What do we tell the IRS in, when we file our return in 2013? Is yeah, you're right. In 2011, I had paid New York State this money, and then in 2012, they gave it back to me. Because, and you see why that is, because this reduced our taxable income. So we paid less tax in 2011 than we should have. So they said, well, this year, you're going you're gonna to have to pay more. So if they gave you back the money, then now you have to report it as income in 2012. <coughs> Line 11. <laughs> Line 11 is alimony. So remember, all these items that we're looking at are forms of income, items that um, Congress has determined as income. Line 12 is business income or loss. Which this is going to be on Schedule C. All right, so that's line 12. Then we have Schedule D, which is capital gains. Capital gains and losses. So on Schedule D, that's where we're going to do the computation. So on Schedule D, we're going to have to indicate the date that we bought the securities, so the date that we bought the stock, how much we paid for it, the date that we sold it, and how much we sold it for. And then with that information, then we could determine whether or not we actually had a gain or we had a loss. Now, historically, the information that the brokerage firm that, um, would report to the IRS is the amount of proceeds, but not the basis. So the course basis is what we paid. What we paid for the stock, for example. Now the IRS um, is requiring that the brokerage firm, for example, disclose not just the amount of the total proceeds. So in other words, the total proceeds being what you sold the stock for, right? What you sold one share of stock for and how many shares that, um, that you sold. So let's say you sold the stock for $52. And you sold 1,000 shares. So that's $52,000. And then you have a brokerage fee. So they would report the $52,000 minus the brokerage fee. But now, what they didn't report is the basis, the cost basis. So they know that you receive something less than $52,000, but they want to know, well, what did you buy that stock for? So you sold it for $52,000, maybe you bought it for $22,000. Maybe you bought it at $22 a share and sold it for $52 a share. 
So from the proceeds, you subtract a cost, which in that case means that you had a gain of how much? About $30,000, right? So about $30,000. Um, we need to pay tax on that, right? So that's on Schedule D. We're going to go through those computations. Now, we might have had some other shares that we sold that we lost $20,000. We sold them. We finally we, we held them. And then we decided, I, just, I need to get out, right? I need to, I'm just going to sell them even though I'm, I'm losing money. You lost $20,000. So we were able to make an adjustment for that. So on that transaction, we made $30,000. On the second transaction, we lost $20,000, so our net gain is $10,000. That's what we record on line 13. So we, take, we do the computations um, and um, outline the transactions on Schedule D, and then at the end of Schedule D, we um, add together the, um, the different lines to determine what is the total amount of the gain or the loss. So that's income. So you might think, oh, I was taking a risk. I bought these shares, I, and then I sold them, and I made some money. That's income that we have to pay tax on. What about if... <coughs> We have, um, besides those transactions, we have some other gains and losses. That's going to be income. And let's say, do you remember all the time we're talking about, right, talking about contributions into our IRA. What line 15 says is that, well, all those years that you were making adjustments, you were making adjustments to your gross income by subtracting, right, that's what this is, these are all minus signs. So from our gross income, from our gross income, we have these adjustments. And so we have those IRA, we make those IRA adjustments, but line 15 says, well, what about if there was an IRA distribution? Now, this is analogous to our discussion about um, state and federal tax refunds. Do you see that? Why? What's going on here? This is income. So if you have an IRA distribution, that means you withdrew $10,000 from your IRA, why would you need to report that as income? You say, what do you mean? That's, coach, that's my money. Don't mess with my money, coach. Homie, don't play that. Why would you now have to, I don't understand. I took $10,000 out of my IRA that's my money. I'm not bothering nobody. <laughs> Why would I have to report that as income? Why would we need to report that $10,000 as income? What do you think? It was not any. Yeah, we never paid tax on that money. So all those years, we were taking adjustments on our gross income. Every year, we're taking that IRA adjustment. Now, we reached a point where we're able to take money out of our IRA and we take out $10,000. Well, we have to pay tax on that because like Karen said, we've never paid tax on that money before. Yes, it's ours. But it's ours and also part of it belongs to the U.S. Treasury. So there's... You know what the, do you know, the, you know, we always talk about the IRS. You ever hear that? We always say the IRS, the IRS, 
The IRS. You know why we always talk about the IRS? Watch, I'm going to show you right now. <laughs> watch, watch, here we go. This is the IRS. <laughs> what does that say? Yes. Yes. Theirs. There's ours and there's theirs. Theirs. So, theirs. Theirs. They say, we don't, you don't need to give us everything, but that's income. Right, Karen? We never paid income tax on, um, on that money. It was an adjustment to our gross income, so we just took it, we put it in our IRA, and the, and the Congress says, we're fine with that, that's okay, we want you to do that. So again, the reason why we're able to do this is because Congress has a policy. They have a public policy about encouraging savings and saving for retirement. So how do you get people to do that? You have to provide some incentive. So the incentive is, we will let you put money in the IRA and you'll not pay tax on it now. And it'll be, so it'll be an adjustment on your gross income. But when you take money out, you're gonna have to pay tax on that distribution. Is that reasonable? That's fair, as fair as theirs gets. Right? So we um, deferred. We deferred our tax obligation. They didn't say you didn't ever have to pay tax. They said, we're going to defer it to a later date. And once you take the money out of the IRA, then you're going to have to pay tax. Corinne? Yeah, is that the only adjustment that we end up paying tax on um, Let's see. Out of these? Yes. Hmm. Well, this is not all of them, but let's see. Let me look at the, at the full list and see if there's any others there. Yeah, I think, I think that's, let's see, I think that's the only one, the only adjustment that, um, like for example, we have student loan interest, so that's an adjustment to gross income, when that's not going to be an issue at a later date. Or alimony, you paid it, um, I don't really think after you paid the alimony that you're ever going to get that money back. <laughs> right? I've never, I've never heard of that before. Um, not even on Judge Judy. I never, I've never heard of that. So I don't really think. What do you, what do you think, Susie? No, right? I don't think that you're going to get that money back. So the moving expenses, you paid it. Um, health savings. So the government says you could put, you know, pre-tax money away to cover um, taxes, bills, and so forth. And that's allocated specifically for that. So they expect that you're going to take money out of there and spend it to cover MRIs or um, hospitalization and so on. And the trick to that, I think, is if you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. For the health, health savings? Yeah. Over what period of time? I think it's within a year. If you don't use it within a year, any extra excess that you have in there, you will lose it. Mm. All right, well, we'll have to check. We'll, uh, we'll check in Publication 17. Yeah, so you usually have to make an adjustment and pay a little lower. It's better you pay low, and that way you use the all you have than you pay Yeah, more. well, definitely. Because you can only use the money for health stuff, mm -hmm. whether it's vitamins or medical stuff. Right. And then after... Um, After Isn't there a limit the on income, savings, by the way? What? Isn't there a limit on health savings? Isn't it yeah. 500 or something? Yeah. There's a limit, but um, what um, Sharon is saying is that what happens if you don't use um, all the money that's in there, whatever the amount is, and she says, like, if you don't use it, you lose it. So, um, But isn't that's that optional? optional? It is optional. It is optional. It is optional. You don't have to put money in it at all. Right. 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 And just like with the IRA, they're not forcing you to do it, but they say if you do, if you, if you do put money into the IRA, um, we'll let you make an adjustment to your gross income, but at the day when you do take the money out, you're going to have to pay tax on that. Another question. Another question. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. 
No, that, but that's the idea is that when you take the money out, so right now you're making a lot of money, and then when you start to take money out um, from your IRA, the presumption is that you're much older and you have much less income, you've retired, and so that um, your tax rate is much lower. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah, it's not, it's not like Social Security where basically you're just being robbed. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah um, you know, it depends what your situation is at that time. So in the best case situation, your income is substantially less and your tax rate is substantially less, so you're paying less on that money than you would have when you were a shop caller, right? When you were making lots of money, you're young, making lots of money. Um, if you didn't put in an IRA, you would pay a much higher tax rate. Now, in the worst case scenario, you're still going to have to pay the same rate because maybe after you retire, right, your, this goes down, your wages and salaries might go down to zero. But now you have all this rental income and you have your stocks that are, um, have quadrupled and maybe gone up 20-fold. And you're getting, you know, lots of dividends and rental income and all of that. So, um, in the worst case scenario, you're not paying a, more than you would have, but you deferred it. And you might have deferred it 20, even 30, 40 years you deferred paying that tax. So, yeah, that's a pretty good deal. And over those 40 years that you're putting money into your IRA, you're earning interest. I hope so. I hope you're earning interest um, on that money or you're accruing some type of um, capital appreciation. And then sometime, a long time from now, um, when you take money out of the IRA, you're going to have to pay tax on it. It might be less than you would have or it might be the same or in some cases if your investments did really well, maybe even they're going to end up paying more, but you don't have to pay it, right? The tax is deferred. We deferred the tax, could be 40 years. For some of you, it is 40 years. For others, <laughs> not so many. Uh, coach, with the IRA, do you have an option where you can actually uh, pay once you take the, the funds out of it? Do you have the option of um, taking the tax as well? at that time and then um, still apply to your cap on um, to your income like your full income like for instance if you take a you said ten thousand dollars out of it at the end of the year and you also pay taxes on it when you, you take it out mm -hmm. what do you do with the taxes do you actually um, apply the taxes again or once you take so whatever you take out you have to report on line 15 let's say the ten thousand dollars and that in effect is going to increase your gross income. But if you choose to pay the taxes at the no, time so you take it out, it. do you include it in your... Where well, do you include that taxes at the end of the year? Yeah, because what you're going to... It's going to be part of your payments then. Right. Okay. So right. if they were some kind of withholding where Correct. when they gave you the 10000 they actually gave you 8200 Right. then you're going to report that the 10000 mm -hmm. and on line 15 and then the payments you were, you're going to get credit for that. But you still need to report it here. The fact, yeah, the full amount, the fact that you, there was some type of withholding, we're going we're gonna to capture that, but you still need to report that at line 15. And then we'll make the adjustment, um, the adjustment afterwards. And then we have pensions. Yeah, so if you work for a company, they say we'll give you a pension. Well, when you start receiving the pension, the IRS says, well, that's income. That's income. Just like all these other things are income, just like your wages and salaries and your interest and your dividends, all of those things are income. If you receive a pension, you have to pay tax on that. Now, Schedule E is one of the main things that we'll record on Schedule E 
is rental income and also um, subchapter S income. Because remember, an S corp is what? How do we define an S corp? What type of entity is that? It's a corporation. But, but there's a term there's, um, that describes the nature of that entity. It's known as a flow through. Right, so an S corp is a flow through. So the um, the corporation prepares a K one. That's the form where they list all the shareholders. So their names and their social security numbers and how much was distributed to them. That's filed with the IRS. So the corporation itself doesn't pay any tax. That's what we said. Remember on the first day we said. That's the beauty of having an S corp. There's no double taxation. It's just a flow through entity. The S corp is not going to pay tax. The profits are going to flow through to the shareholders. The shareholders are going to pay the tax. Whereas um, with a C corp, remember we said, right, Alicia? The corporation is going to pay tax. They have a certain amount of net income. Remember we said we could either keep that as retained earnings or pay it as dividends. And they decide that um, after they pay the tax, what's left after the tax, right, they're going to give us dividends. So they've paid money. They've already paid the tax on that money. And then what's left, they pay, to, they pay a portion of that as dividends to the shareholders. Well, and then when the shareholders receive the money, then they have to pay tax. That's us. That's the double taxation part. Is it crazy? It's, yeah, it's a little crazy, but this is um, the norm. This is absolutely the norm. This is the way it's been for decades. General Motors, double taxation. Merck Pharmaceuticals, double taxation. Any of these companies, big companies that you could name, there's double taxation. The corporation pays tax on their income. And then a certain amount of that, they distribute to the shareholders as dividends. When the dividends are received by the shareholders, they also have to pay tax on the same money. Remember we talked about that on the first day? It's not different money, it's the same pile of money. Remember, we said, what did we say? It was like $100, $100 million? So it was $100 million. That was um, the income for the company. And then what? They paid tax. So they paid what? $40 million in tax. They were left with $60 million. Part of that they keep as retained earnings, and part of it they pay the dividends. Even if they pay the whole sixty million as dividends, let's say they did, then when we receive it, when the shareholders receive that sixty million dollars, they're going to have to pay tax. So the rub is the double taxation is that. This is the 60 million is part of that same 100 million. We paid the tax. Here it is, we paid the tax, this is what's left. Now they say, well, if you keep it as retained earnings, that's fine. If now, the money that you've already paid tax on, you give it to the shareholders, when they receive it, it's income to them, and they have to pay tax. And you're saying, you have got to be kidding. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. So, if you're a, um, if you're incorporated and you have a um, hundred or less shareholders, you could um, elect with the IRS to be considered an S corporation. It has nothing to do with the Department of State, whether or not, you know, when you file to be incorporated, that's something else. You're still a corporation. This has to do with how your income is treated. The IRS deals with that issue. The IRS will determine whether or not you can be classified, right, if you elect um, S-Corp status, whether or not you can be classified 
as an S corporation so that you don't pay double taxation. So that's reasonable. Okay. They said, Is that realistic though? They said, you know, it's like the way I see myself. So I see myself as, um, as an ogre, but like a friendly ogre, like Shrek. You see, that's the way the IRS is too. They're like, I know, where you see us, and you think that we're an ogre, you think that we're mean, but we understand, if it's a small corporation, we understand why you incorporate, and by the way, we encourage you to incorporate, because to incorporate um, is really very inexpensive. Right, so the filing fees are less than $1,000. So if you're thinking, oh, it costs $50,000 to incorporate, no, it doesn't. And so the fees are less than $1,000, and then there's some scam artists that might try and charge you $2,500 or $5,000 to prepare um, this, the, um, the application for incorporation. So it's, it's not a lot of money. I would do it for free. If you have a business you want to incorporate, I'll, I'll file, uh, I'll prepare your... Um, your incorporation application. So, double taxation is a reality, but the IRS says, believe it or not, we're reasonable. If you um, if you have a hundred or less shareholders, and there's some other criteria, then you might avoid double taxation and operate as a flow-through entity. Now, Schedule E, that's on line 17. That's where, um, you want to see if we could um, close that window a little bit? <laughs> Halfway? How about all the ways? Oh, you buy? More, more, more. All right, so. On line 17 is where we're going to indicate whether or not we have a loss or a gain from our S Corp or from our rental property, for example. That's what I was um, previewing with us before about Schedule E and the rental property. Now, on Schedule E, you could have multiple rental properties. That's okay. So you just list the on each line, it lists the address of the property. And then for each property, you indicate um, the income, so the rent that you received. And then you list your expenses. So what are some of the expenses you could take on Schedule E? Who remembers? If you, utilities, yes, you could take utilities. If you paid utilities, you could take utilities. So. Usually, for a rental property, like let's say you're renting a house, it's somewhat unusual that the landlord would pay utilities unless there's some kind of common area that is shared by, let's say, multiple tenants. Like, let's say, for example, um, the outside lighting, you know, like the floodlights. Then the tenants might say, why would I pay for that? So, um, but it's all what's agreed upon. If the tenant says, look, I'll just pay it. Um, but usually there's a separate meter for common area. So the lights in the hallway, the lights outside, around the house, for the lamppost, whatever. There would be a separate meter for that. And so the tenant would have their own electric bill. That's fine. We don't get involved in that at all. If we get an electric bill in our name for that property, then that's an expense. If we have to pay um, to heat the building or the house, then that's an expense to us, like um, Tamara is saying. Then um, that's a utility. If the tenant pays for the heat, then we can't take that as an expense. I know you want to, but we can't take that. Only expenses that we incurred and paid. Now, does that sound funny? Because if somebody else, if Corinne pays my gas bill, then I can't take that. So if Corinne paid to heat my building, if she paid the oil company or the gas company, if she paid $12,000 to them, then 
I can't take that as an expense. How could I take that as an expense? I didn't pay it. It's an expense that we incur and that we pay. So utilities, you're absolutely right. Um, maintenance, I think Alicia said maintenance, Sharon, uh, maintenance. If you're, yes, so if you on that property, if we're gonna have um, uh, insurance on the building, then that's an expense, absolutely. Um, so property insurance, liability, you're getting all choked up, right? I know. <laughs> so um, property insurance, liability insurance, so we have liability insurance in case somebody um, falls on their shoelaces. Yeah, so we have insurance for that. And um, mortgage insurance, so those are expenses that we have. The um, mortgage interest, so we don't own the property outright. We had to borrow money from the bank and we owe this money and we're paying interest on the loan. That's also an expense. What else? What is the other interest this on? I think there's a line that says other interest. Okay, let's finish this. <laughs> <laughs> what line I love that as you try to like redirect the conversation. But we're gonna we're gonna come back to it in a second. Just let's finish this because this is free advice. Yeah. What Next time I'm gonna charge. What I'm telling you is how to manage, right? How to prepare your schedule E. Alright? So Repairs? Yeah. What about land tax? Would that be included as an expense if you're paying the land tax? Absolutely. So the property tax. So if you're paying um, property tax on um, that building that you're renting, absolutely, that's an expense. And depending on where you are and the size of the property, it could be extremely substantial. How do you like that? Extremely substantial. So it could be anywhere from like $1,200, which believe it or not is not a lot for property tax. Um, even in Brooklyn, it's not $1,200 anymore. So even um, for a relatively um, small house, let's say 20, a lot that's like 20 feet by 100 feet, you're gonna pay for a single family home like about $3,500 um, in property tax, just to give you a sense of perspective. Um, some parts of Long Island, people are paying $18,000 and $20,000 a year in property tax. So if it's a property that you own that you're renting, then, like Sharon is saying, that's an expense. Something else, very important. How about the depreciation? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Depreciation um, is very significant. So, really, you know, some people they feel like, well, what if I don't tell the IRS that I have this rental income? Am I better off? But look at all the things that we just listed. So now, if you have a property agent, they're going to report that. So you really don't have much of a choice, even though I encourage you to do what is ethical and legal. But if you think that you're going to do things that um, you think that you could get away with doing, that's definitely not one of them if you have a property agent. Now, the management fees, that 10%, usually it's 10%, that you pay to the management company to collect the rents from the tenant, then that's an expense that you can deduct. Now, the depreciation can, is very significant. That's a significant, the things that we just discussed says what? What is Congress's intent? What does it tell us about how they feel about rental property, about people owning homes and buildings and renting them? Yeah, and the and it's like yeah they, there's definitely incentives. They view that, the Congress views that as favorable, and based on all the things that we just listed as offsets on the income, which is the rent, we could conclude that Congress is in favor of people renting properties. The depreciation is very significant. How do you calculate the depreciation? 
So um, what you have to do is take the fair market value of the property, and then the IRS, um, there's, you divide it by um, the number of years, which I believe is 27 and a half years. Is it 27 and a half years? And then that's going to be the annual depreciation. So let's say the value of the house is um, $275,000. That means you could deduct $10,000 um, a year in depreciation. So it's very substantial. You might be wondering, how could you make money renting properties? And that's exactly the point. It's not so easy to make money renting properties. So this might actually be a negative number. We might actually have a loss. So great, great. We had a property, um, or multiple properties that we record on Schedule E that generated $500,000 in income. That's great. And even the IRS is like, e right? But then what? Then you find out that your expenses are $650,000. So we're thinking, we're hoping for the long term that we're going to have this, you know, maybe capital appreciation in the property. We're thinking by the time we're ready to retire, we'll actually be making money. We'll just be, right, we're just collecting rent and um, we'll have our expenses will be much lower, um, hopefully. Or maybe we'll just, we'll sell the property in 10 years or, or 20 years. Um. What if you pay for the property taxes and the income mortgage, but it's not under your name? Let's say your family relative owns the house. Um, would that be deductible or? Well, I wouldn't do it the way that you described it because <clears throat> it's not only that you have, that you pay um, the, like in this case, the property tax or the mortgage interest, um, which in most cases, the mortgage payment is really, most of it is interest anyway in the early parts of the, of the mortgage. Even after the first 10 years, you're still most of it is interest. But um, when you get the 1098, it'll tell you exactly how much you paid in mortgage interest. The thing is that, is there an insurable interest? Is... Um, one of the things that you have to look at. So like, for example, you might say you want to get insurance on that property, right? Because you feel like you're paying the property tax, but you don't have an insurable interest. So the question is, from the IRS's perspective, do you have an obligation to pay? So are you responsible for paying? So you paid it, everybody's trying to figure out um, understand the nature of that agreement, but did you have an obligation to pay? So it's the same type of thing like with Corinne, like that's I think where you were going with that, right, where, um, yeah, Corinne paid, you know, and I appreciate that, God bless you, um, <laughs> but I can't take that as a deduction, so now you're saying, well, what about Corinne? Could Corinne take that as a deduction? Well, so, how would Corinne be able to take that as a deduction if she didn't have an obligation to pay? You see, so you paid, so you have to have both an obligation to pay and you pay. Both, both criteria have got to be met. And we're gonna talk, um, when we talk a little bit, a couple more items about, what do we got, three more hours? We're gonna talk about, Will be, it will be the same thing uh, about other property, like let's say a car. Um, family owns a car and it gets into an accident or something, or you repair on that car, you pay for it. You use the car and you pay for the repair, but can you deduct those monies? If it's well, for a car, why would you, uh, what, what, what part of the code, the tax code says that you could deduct repairs for your car? Uh, isn't it uh, like you use that car for your job or for, for your job or for your business? Okay. But it's not under your it's not registered under your name, even though it's your car. 
Now, see, now you know why Judge Judy has such, a, has such a strong following. See, I don't... Why would you do that? <laughs> Seriously, why would you do that? Um, you have to have an obligation to pay and pay. So you're telling me that you paid even though you weren't obligated to pay. No, but you're using the you're using the car. It could be that your credit is messed up. You had one of your relative. See, the things that the reason why I'm asking these questions is because these are the kind of questions that we see on um on quizzes. So I want to get the like you know um, the and the definite answers so we could get those questions right. <laughs> because when I was doing those questions, I, was I sent you the answers. Um, no, I'm talking about <laughs> for quiz three and five. For quizzes three, one, two, and three. Um, um, which one did we just take? Which is quiz four, five, five, four, five, four, five, five. four okay. and five? Four and five. Yeah, okay. Right. I'm taking uh, these questions are from quiz five, actually. Right. So, so I, I answered the question, but you keep asking me to say, I know you don't like the answer. No, I just said, uh, okay. All right, I guess. Uh, I'll see when I get No, I mean, I mean, it's not, it's not like a, uh, to me, this is not like a gray area. It's the IRS um, feels that their position um, on the matters that you mentioned are clear. They feel that you have to have the responsibility to pay and you pay. If you didn't have responsibility to pay and you paid anyway, then... So what if somebody buys a car for you? It's not in your name, but it is your responsibility to take on... Take on the well, so but you don't have an insurable interest. Even so, if somebody bought it in your name and you're using it, it has to be an insurable interest. So you can't, um, can't you can't get insurance. You won't be able to get insurance on that property. Why? Because they say, well, you don't own it. Um, you need to own something. You add the dri additional driver. Your name is listed as a driver. Um, okay. That doesn't make you an owner. That doesn't give you an insurable interest. So you're a listed driver, of course. And there's you, if there's, you might have two, three, four people living in your household. Those, you're supposed to list them as drivers. That doesn't mean they have an insurable interest. That means that you're letting the insurance company know that um, these people are, have a license to drive, they live in your household, and that they, from time to time, might be driving the car. So the fact that they have access to your car is important for the insurance company in determining your premium, how much you must pay, but you still don't have an insurable interest, even though, even though you're considered under the auto policy a covered person. You're a covered person in the insurance policy, but you don't have an insurable um, interest. Okay. All right. All right. So that's it for now. <laughs> because we could go. There's like a million examples that we could go over. And scenarios. Oh, can you let's go. Do, let's go up to um, eighteen. I have a question. All right. Is it about you have a car? You let it Because <laughs> I'm not kidding. I saw this last week on um, what's her name, Judge Melanez. What is her name? Yeah, yeah. I saw it last last week on um, People's Court. All right. Go ahead, Tamara. Can you put um, a rental property on Schedule C? I know rental property. Um, well, specifically Schedule E is for rental property. Right. Other than um, rental property, other businesses that you have, you would report on Schedule C. Right. right, so for rental property, you should put that on Schedule E, not Schedule C. If you have other businesses, you have um, uh, a hair salon right. or um, some other type of business, then that's going to be on Schedule E. But for rental, see, remember, we talked about what is Congress thinking and their view about S-Corps and um, rental properties. Yeah, that's got to be on Schedule E. They want to capture that separately. So... <coughs> you mean other businesses have to be on Schedule C? Right, for us, right? So if it's a, if it's a sole proprietorship, other business income that uh, that we have. Now, remember, we talked about, um, we said, well, you know, in terms of forms, 1040. We said also for partnerships is 1065. For corporations is 1120. Right? So that's 
Don't let's let's remember here we're just talking about individual personal income tax. Now a corporation, they still this is for a C corp. This is for a partnership. They need to file. Um, they need to file um, tax returns. And uh, the S corp needs to also file a tax return, right? So remember, we're just talking about personal income that um, that we received. So your your rental property might actually be a loss, or it could be a gain. But with all those deductions and right, all those expenses, including Minji said depreciation. Wow, now once you get depreciation, then the numbers, your, your income starts to get um, small pretty, pretty quick. It might, be, it might be profitable, you know, if you don't have a lot of expenses in terms of um, maintenance and repairs and the, um, maybe your mortgage interest, maybe you've already, you know, you're paying down your mortgage, then maybe the, um, the, pro the property could be profitable. Uh, professor? Farm income. <laughs> Farm income. <laughs> so, this is also, um, believe it or not, the United States is um, shifted from an agricultural society, although at one time agriculture was a big part of the U.S. economy. And though it does still produce a large percentage of the food for the world, the farmers in the United States, in large part, are struggling. And so there's farm subsidies, for example, that Congress provides. And so in that regard, there's a separate line. So in the 2012 return, line 18, is about farm income. So most of us here, we don't really think about that because you know we work in offices and manufacturing facilities um, or some type of service industry. In fact, a large part of the US economy is a service business. Although we do have some agricultural um, aspects to our economy, Congress is focusing on this. They want to know. So farm income, whether it's a gain or a loss, we're going to report that on a separate line. So again, that tells us if there's a separate line for that, then that's of special interest. But all the things that we're going through here is income, different types of income. Congress has gone through a lot of trouble to identify different types of income, and each of these has its own line. Now, unemployment. Unemployment compensation. And the definition of, um, of income is expanding over time. You know what, um, what an in-kind transfer is? in-kind transfer or a non-cash um, source of income. That's like a gift? Well, it, it might actually be a gift, but what it means is that, for example, you receive some type of benefit from your employer. So we have here line 19 is unemployment, 20 is social security benefits, 21 is other income, and line 22 is total income, right? So that's gross. That's our gross income. So you might be wondering, oh wait a minute, Social Security, why do I have to pay tax on Social Security? Because then we go back and say, oh, here we go again. That's my money. Why am I paying tax? Because now you might have an argument. Now you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, coach, this is something different. That money I paid into the IRA, that was pre-tax. I got an adjustment for that, right? My gross income was adjusted for that IRA. I never paid tax on that money. But the money that I paid into Social Security, 
That was after tax. So why would I have to pay tax on that? Double tax? Um, maybe it could be a type of double tax, but what, what do you think? Why is it? Because there are some, some people who didn't really work. Um, oh, that's interesting. Well, that's, they, they, well, that's yeah. people not paying in. So well, so, well, a separate issue, just an editorial comment, okay, about Social Security that Mohammed is alluding to is that <clears throat> people pay into Social Security, and at some point in time, when they retire, they receive payments. Mohammed is saying that some people don't pay into Social Security, and they still receive payments. That's a little weird to me. No, what I'm saying <laughs> is that what if they didn't work so that they just worked for five years and after that they just didn't work and they uh, um, started receiving their social security. So maybe it's just that uh, they didn't work enough to pay tax enough taxes. So maybe they just want to take out taxes. Um, well, that's what you described does happen. But the reason why um, Congress um, has decided, and they thought about this for quite a long time because this wasn't always the case. The reason why they decided they would tax Social Security benefits is because they said, you know, you don't realize this, but we do. The amount of money that you pay into Social Security, FICA, right, that you pay into Social Security, your employer matches that. But at the end of the year, you don't put that as part of your wages, salaries, and tips. Now, um... That's thousands of dollars, right? Depending on, it's a percentage of your income, so you know, it could be um, a couple of thousand dollars, it might be six thousand dollars. So let's say, for example, our income is such that we pay in FICO, we pay in towards Social Security, six thousand dollars. Our employer also pays in six thousand dollars. So the government receives twelve thousand dollars. So um, Congress said, well, you never paid the Someday, that $6,000 that your employer paid on your behalf, you're going to get that, and you never paid tax on that. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? <laughs> um, Congress says we need money to operate the government. So you want to um, you want to have the government provide these different services and benefits, um, sustain a military, etc., 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 then we need money. We need to pay the president. Where is that money going to come from? This, I mean, well, there's two places. The two places is either from revenues we, the government receives through taxes, which is actually um, relatively small compared to borrowing. The government is spending more than its income. So after you take all the income that the IRS worked so hard, the IRS and their entire team to collect from us to achieve compliance, the government, the federal government still has to borrow money to cover it, its expenses. To how much? How much is our national debt now? <coughs> trillions, right? Is it like three trillion dollars in national debt? And a significant percentage of that debt is owned by, well, for, well just for example, China. So um, people outside of the U.S., governments outside of the U.S., so... Um, about a trillion dollars in U.S. debt is owned by China. So we have to, so that's why they're like, you know what? We just want to do what's fair. We understand financial markets and financial institutions and financial um, <clears throat> forms of, fin of compensation. We just feel that since that's a type of, that's part of your wage, it's part of your salary, that even though it's, um, you're not receiving it at that time, that you should pay tax. We're not trying to rob you, and whenever people say that, right, 
you got to be concerned. <laughs> like a student, a couple of years ago, the student stopped me at the front of Whitehead and walked up to me and said, by the way, stuff like this you can't make up. The student said to me, um, 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 just like this, just like that, um, 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 excuse me, um, and I'm like, do you know where I could find Professor Bissell? <laughs> so, the first thing I do is, I look to my left, and then I look to my right, and then before I can even say anything, the student says, wait, are you, are you Professor Bissell? So I haven't still, I still haven't said anything. And then she goes on and on and on about how she wanted to get an overtally into my class. And I told her, I said, we have an exam on Tuesday. <laughs> so I don't really think that's feasible. And then she's, she's really like wired. And then she says to me, she says, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, you're not nervous, are you? <laughs> and I said, well, I wasn't nervous until you asked me if I was nervous. Now I'm nervous. Why would I be nervous? Yeah, so. <laughs> you can't, you, really, you can't make this stuff up. You, do, you can't, you really can't. True story, true story. True story. Um, okay. Janelle! Can, oh. <laughs> uh oh, be careful with that. <laughs> Can the employer deduct the, the uh, social security tax that was paid? Um, <coughs> well, which employee? employee? If you're self-employed... The but the employer. The employer. Oh, from their, it's yes, the for their, um, on their corporate return? They can yeah, that's uh, an expense. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Um, quick question. So I was at the court and... The what? At the criminal court for the one I get yes. to them. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's like, I, trust me, I also hear a lot of things you can't make up. But one of the things is, when I interview them, we ask them, do you work, are you employed? Most of them always say, no, they're unemployed. And they never worked, but then they say they receive Social Security benefits, or either SSD or disability benefits, or just Social Security benefits. So then, where would that go under? Would that be under the Social Security benefits? That's not taxable. Um, is it not taxable for them, or? For SSI? For, for the SSI that they receive. Some receive the, disability, the SSD and some receive SSI. Right, so what do you, what do you think, Tanya? For SSI? I don't think there's... Um, the SSD. The, 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 the disability benefits are not taxable. Right, so... Do you know what this means? Does anybody know what this means? My opinion. Who said that? Omar. So, yes. <laughs> in my opinion, in my opinion, IMO, in my opinion, the government should not be using Social Security funds to pay S what they call SSI or SSD. If the government feels that they want to um, provide assistance to those individuals, I have no issue with that. Don't take it from the Social Security Trust. That's, people paid into that. That's not um, public assistance. Okay, um, it's okay so that the government provides public assistance for people that are in need. I think that's a great idea. But this is not public assistance. This is, I paid in. Now over the course of your lifetime, you're going to see you paid in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now fortunately, it's capped. Right? <laughs> the amount of FICA. So don't worry. If you're making $5 million or um, 500000 the amount of FICA that you pay is the same. So each year, um, the limit goes up a little bit. You know, it's like 121000 It's like 123000 like So there is a cap. So roughly, um, the cap now is... Roughly, all right, don't hold me to this. this is, I'm just a, some quick number crunching here. About $7,500. Six. 
yeah, about, about $7,500 is the cap, which is just based on a percentage of your income. So it might be you might only pay $6,200, but the cap is about $7,500. They usually don't talk about it in that terms. They talk about it as a percentage of a figure that they set, that they adjust every year. And that equates to some number, $7,216, etc. So fortunately, there's some sanity to, the, to this situation. Otherwise, I mean, it would be ridiculous. Imagine you were making a million dollars a year, which soon all of you will be, and <laughs> they were literally taking six and a quarter percent of your salary and putting it into the Social Security Trust Fund, which we might need to do at some point. Because why? Because they keep robbing the Social Security Trust Fund. We paid in. The employer matched that. They have billions and billions of dollars. You're paying to people that, like Mohammed also addressed and Kevin is mentioning, that never paid in. Now, if you want to, again, if you want to, if the government wants to give them assistance, fine, but you should take that from the general fund, not from this trust, not from the Social Security Trust Fund. Because by the time we retire, <laughs> right? Because like you're saying, there's people who never worked, or maybe they worked one year and then they're getting benefits. So that's not how is how is that fair, right? How is that now? If the government says, but I know, but this person is in need. Okay, so if you determine a certain amount that you feel is appropriate, that's fine. But don't take it out of this basically annuity, this insurance, right? We're paying into to, um, to an annuity. Right. So to go back, I'm not sure if we didn't really close on Karen's question. So if you're receiving um, this money, like just like if you're receiving other types of um, public assistance, that's not going to be taxable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's another thing that really gets to me when I interview some of well, most most of these people um, that I interview. Some, these are they, criminal cases. Criminal, mm -hmm. criminal court. Mm -hmm. uh, like most of them, they're uh, they're receiving SSI. Most of them haven't worked, and they're like, oh, because I have a bullet in my arm, I have a bullet in my leg, I have a bullet in my bed, <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my god, maybe you have a bullet because you know. You're putting bullets in other people as well, you know, and it's, it's like it's crazy. Like it's just right, like, so, yeah, we did, there should be more of a disincentive. Right. So it's like, if you get, if you're committing a crime and a police officer shoots you, you could collect SSD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, really? Like, yeah, yeah. that's crazy. No, I, I understand. I, I share your frustration. <clears throat> yeah. Life. All right, so, we got two more hours. So these are all income. So we add all these up, and that gives us our gross income, our total income. Right? We're good. All of these we're going to do, this is going to capture Schedule C, Line 13, Schedule D, um, right, for 2012. Line 17 is going to capture Schedule E, right, for the rental income. So that's where we're going to attach the schedule, but... The last line on the schedule is what we put here. So after all is said and done, after listing out all our expenses, we find out what we do. We subtract from our income, our expenses, then we find out, did we make money or not? Did we have a gain or a loss? That number we report here. The same with Schedule D, we report there. All of these items Congress has determined are income and should be taxed. So we add all of them up and we get our total income, which we could also refer to as our gross income. Our gross income, why? Because from that number, we're going to make some adjustments. Yes, this is the minus sign. These are most of them. Some of them we talked about of important interest um, to many of you is also student loan interest, which is subject to um, a certain level of income. And where after we make those adjustments from the gross income, we get what? Our adjusted gross income. 
our adjusted gross income. That's not, in my opinion, it is. It's not IMO. It's when we subtract the adjustment from our gross income, we get our adjusted gross income. So we have our income. We subtract from our gross income the adjustments, which gives us, which leaves us with our adjusted gross income. Then we need to decide whether or not we're going to use a standard deduction or an itemized deduction. Now remember, last time we also talked about filing status. So the reason why the filing status is significant is because that's going to determine what comes, this is what comes, the filing status is what comes before, see, adjusted gross income and deductions, that's what we're talking about um, in filing status in units three and five. Before, literally on the 1040, before the income is the filing status which we said is single, married, filing jointly. Why do we care about this? You're like, oh, whatever, check any box, <laughs> right? Right, Susie, check any box. Married, filing separately, head of household, right? Why do we care? Why not, why not? What do you think, Corinne? No, anybody, somebody, anybody? Why do we need to, so just above that income, right, on the 1040, we have this section that says, what is your filing status? And we all look at each other like, mm, I don't know. Now remember, well, not your standard deduction, it determines the amount of, right, the value of your exemption. So in 2012, what is the value of the exemption for the single filing status? How much did we say last time? 59.50. Yes, for in 2012 it was 59.50. Yep, you're right, you know, 59.50. Know. So in the code, the um, the Congress has planned some changes to the code, right? It's not a surprise, we know what they are. And so the amount of the exemption changes from year to year. So you might say, oh, I thought it was 5,800, or I thought it was 5,750. Well, yeah, <laughs> um, it changes from year to year. So they're trying to make it, and that's better for us, right? So what about married filing jointly? So you're married, and you and your spouse file a return together, then what is the amount of the exemption, not the standard deduction? Yes. And for married filing separately? And head of household? Right, 8,700. So in order to be head of household, that's where we got into that whole discussion about qualifying child, qualifying person. I think we, we talked that through about, I mean, um, at length about the different tests, the relationship test, the residency um, test, support. the support test. So, What is the, what is Congress's view about filing separately? If one spouse files, oh no, sorry, that's, that's itemizing. Yeah, so filing separately, they say, okay, filing jointly, 11,900. Filing separately, each is 5950. So you say, well, so we each got 5950. Are we worse off? What did I share with you in class about how Congress, what's Congress trying to 
motivate us to do? To file separately or jointly? Jointly. Now, you may have your own reasons why you don't want to do that. Like what? You're worried that when the your that your spouse might run off with the refund. <laughs> but Congress says, Congress has a view about this. They said, we really, we would prefer that if you're married, you file jointly. How do we know if we're married? <laughs> I know you're thinking, if you were married, you know it, right? But what is it? If you were married, let's say you were married um, on January 5th. Right, so remember the last time we said that, as of the last day of the year, either you married or you ain't. <laughs> right, so if your divorce decree went through on December 31st, it was finalized, and your um, divorce, right, you're no longer married, then you have to decide that, well, are we single and we're going to party, or you're head of household. So you have a qualifying person or a um, qualifying relative, a child, qualifying child or qualifying um, person, which a qualifying person is specifically not a qualifying child. And for a qualifying child, in terms of a support test, the qualifying child must not provide more than half of their own support. Interestingly, we said last time, we said, that doesn't say that you provided half their support, just that they don't provide more than half of their own support. But for a qualifying person, it says, we must provide more than half their support. Okay. So that being said, so this is important for us to, um, because this is going to have an impact on the total tax, our net total tax. But that's what's looked at, that's what's before, right, before um, income on the 1040. So it's important for us as tax preparers, we need to determine this. We need to determine, is our client single or are they married? Are they head of household? So to go back, remember, yes, we have reason to believe that Congress favors married filing jointly. Why? Because if you file separately, there are certain limitations as to the credits that you could take. So they said, look, you want to do it this way? You want to file separately? Okay, then remember last time I listed for you a number of different credits. You can't take this credit, that credit, the other credit, right? One of the most significant credits is the education credit. They said no. So if you, have, if you don't believe that we want you to file jointly, well, now you know, right? We would obviously, I mean, they don't need to say this, but remember I said there's always some rationale, there's always some policy that Congress is advocating, there's some point of view that they have, whether it's political or otherwise. If you want to file separately and you're married, that's an option. They said you could do that, but just so that you know, you're going to wind up paying more tax because you're not going to be eligible for these different credits. And in Publication 17, they're listed very clearly what are the different credits. Now, those may not apply to you, then it may work out to be about the same. But you might, have, you might say, well, I don't care, because at least I'm getting my share of the <laughs> <laughs> refund. So I don't have to worry about my spouse running off with the, the refund money. All right, so we have our adjusted gross income. Then we need to decide which is greater, the standard deduction or the itemized deductions. We want to take, we want to take the greater of the two. Now, how much for 2012? How much is the exemption? 3,800? 3, 
number of people. Right. All right. So let's see if we can get through Schedule A before we go, and then we'll uh, we'll throw in the towel. All right. So that gives us till midnight. All right. So here we go. <laughs> Schedule A. The first thing is medical and dental. Schedule A. That's what we're talking about here. So we're talking about itemized deductions. Well, if you do, then you need to complete Schedule A. Now, the first thing is, you can't, and this applied earlier in our prior conversation, you can't take expenses that you didn't pay. So if you say, look, coach, um, my medical expenses were $48,000. I want to take that as a deduction on line one, right, on um, line one of Schedule A. $48,000. Actually, really, if you're in the hospital for like just a week, it could easily be that amount of money, right? So $48,000. And I say, well, okay, that was your medical expense, but how much did you pay? And you say, why are you asking me these kind of questions? And I said, well, we need to know, because you could only take as a deduction, right? Now, importantly, keep in mind that for, for medical and dental, the amount that you're actually going to be able to deduct on line four has to be more than 7.5% more than seven and a half percent of what? So, let's see. Line 38, right? So if you have your um, return, line 38, when you go to the top of that page, you see is your adjusted gross income. So, if, let's say, your adjusted gross income, to keep the number simple, was $100,000. So, all our income, we take our adjustments, our adjusted gross income is $100,000, then what Congress has said is that your medical and dental have got to be more than $7,500. You have had to have paid more than $7,500. So if you say, okay, coach, you, you caught me. It was $48,000, but I only paid $7,500. Then... What's going to happen? You're on line four, you're not going to have any deduction. Why? Because 7.5% of your adjusted gross income is $7,500. From that, um, you have, you, well, so, so line one, you have what you paid, which is $7,500. From that, you subtract the 7.5% of your adjusted gross income, which is $7,500. So that leaves you with on line four, nothing. Now, if you pay $7,000, how much could you deduct on line four? How much? Five. Mom, it says nothing, right? So if you pay, you actually pay. Now, fortunately, your GHI or your Blue Cross Blue Shield paid $43,000. You paid $5,000. How much could you deduct on line four, Schedule A? Nothing. What about if you paid $10,000 and Blue Cross Blue Shield paid the rest? How much can you deduct? $2,500. So you have to, the offset, right, the floor is $7,500 based on your adjusted gross income. So you, um, in that case, you'll be able to take, as an itemized deduction, $2,500. The first $7,500, Congress is saying, you know what? You do your part, that's you. You pay that. And then we'll let you deduct the remaining $2,500. Not as a credit, just as a deduction. So that you're going to reduce your adjusted gross income, which um, ultimately means you're going to reduce your taxable income. That's in last class, I kept saying taxable income, because really, that's what, we're, that's what we're looking at, is what is your taxable income, ultimately. 
Questions about that? So remember, only what you paid. So if somebody says, oh no, just put down whatever your expenses were, that is completely wrong. <laughs> completely. Don't listen to anybody who says that. That's not true. Only you look at what you pay out of pocket. What other people pay, that's irrelevant. That's absolutely irrelevant. Now you might have not, now a lot of Americans, for example, don't have health insurance. So you might have actually had to, you, they might have billed you for the $42,000. How much can you deduct? So suppose they did bill you for the $42,000. How much could you deduct? What do we do? We take the forty-two thousand minus the seventy-five hundred. Thirty-four. How much is that? Thirty-four. Now, that I guess that's kind of like what you would call a trick question, because I said what they build you yeah, for. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure you get bills all the time. <laughs> I get bills all the time. That doesn't mean that I pay them. So remember, this is also very important. An invoice, the IRS does not consider an invoice proof. An invoice is just a bill. That's not proof of payment. If you have dialogue with the IRS, if you're practicing, if you're practicing before the IRS, remember we talked about that in Circular 230, that 48-page document, if you're practicing before the IRS, the IRS wants to see proof of payment. Invoices, bills, that's, that's not going to help you. Proof of payment. If you want invoices, I can give you invoices. Anybody here, just let me know. If you need an invoice, I can give you an invoice. There's got to be proof of payment. Like a receipt? Yeah. No. Well, a receipt, yeah. Well, so a receipt, like, yes, a receipt that says that you paid it. Not just that you were billed, but that you paid it. The best receipt... The best receipt is a canceled check. So you say, but I paid cash. Listen, they believe you. The IRS believes you. Congress believes you. They will believe you more. Right, Tamara? They will believe you more if you have proof. So it's going to become an issue of credibility. You say, I have, I paid them in cash. They gave me a receipt. It's like, well, who, who signed this receipt? Um, some dude. <laughs> <laughs> Some dude signed this? Um, did, and when you got the receipt, did you also give them a check? No. What's the name of the dude? I don't know. I don't know, they say, I don't know, doesn't sound like a name that we're familiar with. Um, you really, you really need to have proof. There's gotta be proof of payment. If you pay by credit card, that, that could work too. Really the most credible is if you have a check because it says, the amount is very clear. It's processed by an independent third party, which is the bank, right? It says who the check was made to, Mr. Dude, and <laughs> the amount, and it's drawn on your checking account number that they could verify, because that's the account that your refund is gonna go to, right? Or the money that, um, that you owe is gonna, the account that it's gonna come out of. So, paying by check. So. What you pay, that's what they're interested in. How much did you pay? So is there any question about that? Because this is very important. It's common for people to think, I had all these expenses. That's what I put down. It says medical and dental expenses on line one, the schedule A. And people think, well, I did. I did have, I did have these expenses, 40 something thousand dollars. But it even says right on the form, Right? For us knuckleheads, it says, do not, do not include expenses reimbursed or paid by others. So just what you paid, just what we paid, again, it might be, you might not have health insurance, so you might have had to pay, you might have paid them the $42,000, or maybe you paid them $500 a month for the for the entire year. So that year, you paid them $6,000. Not the whole $42,000, only the $500 a month, and you have checks for that. All right, so that's medical and dental. Then we have taxes you paid. So the first one, 
on line five, so this is going to be, this is going to, this amount, wait, this is going to turn out to be line four when you're done with the calculation. The taxes you paid was what like we started to talk about before, which is your taxes that you paid to state and local government. It came out as withholding. That was money that you paid. You might have gotten a refund. Well, we've talked about that at great length. That's going to show up here on line 10. That's a deduction. There's no floor. They say dollar for dollar, whatever it is you paid, the $7,292, right? That, you'll um, enter that on line five. Taxes you paid. So one of the taxes that you paid could be um, state and local income tax. Six, line six is um, property tax. So if you paid real estate tax, kind of what um, Sharon was saying before, yeah. Now, for your home, for your home, this is not the property that we're renting, for the home that you live in, this is where we're gonna, if we also have property tax that we're paying, this is where we record it on Schedule A. You can't record it on Schedule A and on Schedule E. So if you write that on Schedule E as part of the expense for your rental property, then that's it. You can't always also put it here. This is for the house that you live in. So you put down the amount of the property tax, right, Sharon? So you can't do both. If you put it on Schedule E, that's fine. That's part of your expenses for that rental property. But the IRS says that, Congress says that um, the house that you live in, if you're paying property tax, right, the house that you own, then you could um, take that as an itemized deduction. There's no floor there. That's not subject to a 7.5% floor or a 2% floor. Whatever it is, whatever you pay for the property tax, $12,000, $18,000. Now, by the way, this is going to be, this is going to show up on your 1098, and this is going to show up on your W-2. Right? So this is the 1098 is the document, the tax document that you receive from your mortgage company. It's going to say how much you pay in property tax. Very often, they pay the property tax for you. Right? So they take escrow, and then <clears throat> they use that money to pay the property tax. So they know exactly um, how much it is, and it shows up on the 1098. If you don't have that arrangement with your mortgage company, you could still take it. You could still, even if it doesn't say it on your 1098, obviously you're paying property tax. I don't, I don't know where you could <laughs> live in the United States where there's no property tax on the land. Is there, is there a state? I don't, I don't really think so. Some states don't have income tax, but property tax, they all sort of got onto that, right? You have to pay tax on the, on the land. So even if it's not, if they didn't pay um, as part of the mortgage payment, right, the escrow, then we could still put that. So you just paid um, New York Department of Finance. You pay them, you send them a check for $3,600. That's fine. It's not on your 1098, but you have the check, which is proof, right? They believe you, Tamara said. They believe you more when they see the canceled check. So you could still take that. I don't know why you think that because it's not on the 1098 that you wouldn't be able to deduct that. You can. So it's a little bit cleaner if it shows up on your 1098 because it says also how much you pay in your mortgage interest and the property tax. But if not, it, it's okay. So again, there's no floor. It's not subject to any 2% floor or 7.5% floor. So that's taxes you pay. Questions about that? You guys are awesome. Yes. And then you have personal property tax, which would be what? So this is property tax on real estate, on real property. Then you have personal property tax. 
And then you have other taxes. Uh, this is getting a little messy here. So what would be an example of other taxes, like foreign taxes? So if you pay taxes to a foreign government, then um, you can take that off here. What is going on here? Whoa. So we have property, state, what do we got here? Okay, this is real property, and then personal property. Can you um, elaborate a bit more on personal property tax? Yeah, so what would be personal property? Like, for example, if you pay, if there's a tax on your car. So that's considered to be personal versus real property. Real property is the, is the land that your house is built on. Um, but personal property, your car, your, um, your boat. So if you have to pay tax on that, then that's something that you could um, take in this section of Schedule A. So we have medical, we have taxes that we pay, and we have interest that we pay. So the big one, now you probably don't remember, but there was a time when, um, for example, um, we could use interest that we paid on credit cards and um, other types of loans, miscellaneous loans, and reduce our taxable income. But that's in the past. But just to give you a sense of um, perspective, now the main um, part of interest that you pay really is, for most people, mortgage interest. Can we go back to the personal property? Personal property. Yeah, is that when you initially buy the car that the taxes that you pay? Oh, so that would actually be what? What would how, what would that be? A sales tax, mm -hmm. right? So is a is that what you're is that what we're talking yeah. about here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't <laughs> it depend? No, the sales tax wouldn't be categorized in in this um, bracket of taxes. Right. So, for example, if just like um, the government assesses a tax on our land, the government could assess a tax on our property. So, in New York, we're used to paying like a license fee on our car or registration fee. Um, in some states, instead of paying a registration fee, they take they do an assessment, and they say instead of um, like, what is it now, like $89 for, to register your car? Mm -hmm. They say, well, no, um, Coach, you're going to pay $89, but Corinne drives a Porsche Panamera. She's going to pay $389 because the, it's not, they don't see it as a registration fee. It's a property tax. So because Corinne drives a car that's worth over $100,000, mm -hmm. then she's going to have to pay more. So that's an example of a property tax. So it's based on the value. See, when you pay $89, everybody pays $89, it's not based on the value of the property. It's just a fee. It's just, um, it's, yeah, it's just an ex expense for us. It's not a tax on our property. So a tax has got to be based on some value. So that would be an example of um, a property tax. So it's an assessment based on the value of the property. If it's not based on the value of the property, then that's just a registration fee or a licensing fee, right? as it relates to cars, for example, in this situation, which we're accustomed to. In other states, they look at the value of the property and use that as a way to determine how much you owe. <clears throat> so interest, we're talking about mortgage interest. Um, gifts, right, so gifts to charity. So we're interested in that there's you know, also points that you could buy on your mortgage, but the main thing 
um, which that could be significant, but the most obvious one for, um, for most people is the amount of interest. Now think about it, if you're paying, this number could be very significant. Suppose your mortgage, if you have a new mortgage and you're paying, let's say about $3,000 a month. So for $3,000 a month, that doesn't mean you're living in a $20 million mansion, so you might, um, you might owe about $400,000 on your mortgage and you're paying $3,000 a month at maybe I would say about 9% or yeah, probably about 9% would give you about a $3,000 a month mortgage payment. Now, most of that is going to be interest. The way, the way it's amortized. So most of that is going to be interest. So that means that you paid $36,000. So maybe, usually like in the first few years, most of it is going to paying down the interest. You might have paid $35,480 in interest and $520 to the principal. That $35,480 you could take off as your mortgage interest. There's no floor. It's not 2% floor, 7.5%, you take that. So if you're a homeowner, if you have a mortgage, once you have that, then you're gonna see it's, it makes sense to itemize. So those are big items. So the mortgage interest um, is, for many people, is um, very often the, the single largest. Unless you have, you know, some significant um, medical um, treatment. Then gifts. Um, interestingly, this is an item that is considered to be um, one that we could itemize. So what does that tell us about Congress's attitude towards gifts and charity? That they do that favorably. They say, you know, we can't do everything. Go ahead. Um, we'll provide a tax shield. Remember, it's not a credit. It's a deduction. Yeah, we'll, we believe in that. We think, yeah, everybody do, do their part. And you could, um, you could deduct that, you know, and make sure you have your checks. You know, um, especially if you're going to tithe. So um, if you're going to give 10% of your salary um, to your church, for example, then they believe you. Right, Tamara? Mm -hmm. They believe you. If you say that you are giving 10% of your income to your church, they believe you. I believe you. <laughs> but they will, Tamara... They will believe you more if you have those canceled checks because 10% is a significant amount to give. But you could do that. Then we have um, casualty and um, theft and job expenses. And then we have miscellaneous and then we have our total itemized deductions. Right, we're almost done. We're almost there. Just give me two more minutes. I know. We'll, 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 we could look at this again. Mm -hmm. Gifts and yeah, gifts. Yeah, we, we schedule A. We'll, we'll spend more time on schedule A. I want to give you an overview now. Yeah, we could we could spend a long time talking about schedule A. You're right. But I want to give you an overview so you see how we um, compute how we compute taxes for an individual. So this is the formula. So we have our gross income, we subtract our adjustments. When we do that, we get our adjusted gross income. We subtract our itemized deductions, and that gives us what? Yeah, our taxable income. So this is going to give us our taxable income. Have I told you you guys are awesome? <laughs> yeah, you guys are awesome. Yeah, but now are you supposed to multiply the taxable income by the tax rate? Wait, not yet. Um, but that's how the layout, the format is online. 
Yeah, and on the 1040, so on the 1040, what happens once we get our taxable income, then we need to determine what the tax is. That's what this is. The tax, that says gross tax. Separate, even if I just take this off, right? Maybe that's, we should, maybe you don't want to put that there, that's okay. Because the reason why we say gross tax, so this is our, what um, Janelle is saying is, yeah, after we subtract from our adjusted gross income, which is the top of um, side two of the 1040, the very first line, after we subtract our itemized deductions, we're gonna get our taxable income. That's our taxable income. Then, once we know what our taxable income is, then we need to determine, Janelle is saying, how much is the tax? All right, so, very often we'll look that up on the table, and we'll see that for head of household, the tax rate is going to be less. So if we, not only do we get the, um, the exemptions, but we'll see that the tax rate for head of household is less. That's why so many people are trying to say, could I put, claim your kid as a dependent? Could I use your kid's social security number? Can I, can Sharon, um, can I use Sharon as a, as a dependent on my return? So we find out what the amount of the tax is. So let's say we look this up on the table in the instructions for um, 1040, which I ordered for you guys. Um, I'm surprised we didn't, we wasn't um, here today, but hopefully next time. I know they're backed up on, um, they're behind in publication 17. But this is the tax, so remember, so we have our taxable income. That's our taxable income. We went through all of that to find out what is our taxable income? So we have the adjustments. Remember, all of this is income. Then we take the adjustments. Then we take our um, deductions. So we took our adjustments, our deductions, so that we could find out what is our taxable income. Once we know our taxable income, now we need to determine how much we owe. So we look up on the table. Very often, we're just going to look it up on the table. But not even today. We're not even going to talk about alternative minimum tax, oh, right? No. Okay, so we look up on the table. So this is, what line is this for 2012? So this is, um, Corinne, is that you? Who said 43? So this is line 43. And then line 44 is now that we know the taxable income, now how much is our tax? So we look that up on the table, we find out how much is the tax. Then we subtract the credits. Mm -hmm. Then we add other taxes that we owe. And then we get the net total tax. That's why over here I put gross, but I, I erased it. So we have the gross tax, this is the amount that we owe. We add, uh, we subtract the credits, we add the other taxes, and then we get, ta-da, the net total tax. That's the tax that we owe. But you say, wait, coach, but I already paid. I already paid something. Okay, whatever we paid, <clears throat> like um, Suzette told us before, they, I paid, I, when I got money out of my IRA, I, I, they took money from me, they had a withholding. When I got my salary, my wages, they took withholding. Those payments and our 1040 ES, our estimated tax payments, all of those, so we're gonna, there's a line for each of those, right? We subtract that from our net total tax, and then we're gonna decide, do we get a refund? Or do we still owe money? 